Uh, welcome everyone to this regularly scheduled meeting of Bridgewater Town Council for June 14th. Um, we have the agenda circulated. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Hearing none, can I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? I move by Councilor Fragier, seconded by Deputy Mayor Tanner. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, motion is carried. Thank you. Are there any announcements from members of council? Still kind of quiet these days. Um, I'll just say that we are on, on target apparently for phase two reopening, which is Wednesday. So with, uh, with the steady as she goes course that we're on, that means um, people can have uh, a total of 10 people inside their homes. It's family, like household members, and others up to 10 total, not family plus 10. Uh, outdoors 25 means indoor dining returns, uh, retail is 50% capacity and there's there's more. So I would suggest that people go to the um, the Nova Scotia coronavirus website. There's a reopening plan there and, and all the things um, that that includes. What it also includes is the ability to meet as, uh, as members of council in person, up to 10 people. Um, so as we continue on this path, then the June 28th meeting will be a hybrid meeting. Um, those members of council who wish to meet in person will be able to meet in council chambers and staff will likely meet us virtually. So I don't know about you, but I'm super excited about um, <laughs> getting back to some in-person in meetings. Anyone else have any announcements? Okay, hearing none, we do have a delegation and we're happy to uh, welcome Jared Woolman here to go over uh, the pickleball proposal. Um, so Jared, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I know you're gonna share your screen with us. Yes, are, are you able to see that? Yes, uh, there we, we can see the pickleball uh, presentation. The floor is yours, Jared. Terrific, thank you. Uh, just wanted to start by by thanking you all for providing me the opportunity uh, to to meet with you and present on behalf of the Bridgewater Pickleball Club. Um, obviously, I'm going to be talking about something that uh, a lot of members of the community are very passionate about, and that's pickleball. For anybody who is maybe not familiar um, with what pickleball is, it's a sport that was invented in the 1970s, and it combines elements of tennis, badminton, and ping pong. It's played primarily outdoors on a badminton sized court and it requires very limited equipment. So really just sneakers, paddle and a pickleball. So a pickleball being a, a small plastic ball with about 40 holes in it or so. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, pickleball has been around since the 1970s, but it's really only seen a massive boom in popularity uh, over the last say 10 or so years. Uh, the Economist, which is a pretty popular uh, subscription website and, and magazine, uh, has actually listed it as the fastest growing sport in North America in terms of new participants every year for the past six years. Uh, so year end uh, turnover has been, re or uh, I guess growth has been really, really quite significant. So much so that there are now over 4 million registered players in the United States. Uh, Canada lags behind a little bit in terms of our number of registered players, uh, but we've also started quite a bit behind in terms of when it was introduced here. Uh, in 2012, we actually had only 6,000 in the entire country, which has now expanded to 75,000. Uh, Pickleball Canada would say that that is really an underrepresentation and that it only captures players who participate in tournaments, uh, which they estimate to be about 15% of total players. So we're looking at quite a substantial uh, number of players in Canada as well. Not surprisingly, with the tremendous growth in terms of the amount of people playing, there's a tremendous growth in terms of the infrastructure that's being provided for those players. Pickleball Canada, in a, in a recent uh, release of information, uh, noted that there's been a, almost a 1,000% increase in the number of outdoor pickleball courts being built in Canada over the past three years. So it kind of begs the question, like, why is pickleball so popular? Well, there are a number of factors that contribute it. I think first and foremost is that it's a highly accessible sport that can be enjoyed by virtually almost anyone. Uh, that I've played in tournaments where people have been as young as five years old. 
uh, and I've seen people as old as 85 years old, 86 years old participating in these tournaments. Uh, I've also been in tournaments where they've had para pickleball, wheelchair pickleball. I simply know even just from the, our, the club here in Bridgewater that we have uh, members who have Lyme disease, who have had hip and knee replacements, uh, who have had heart attacks, have Parkinson's. Uh, it is incredibly accessible sport that can really be enjoyed by everyone. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that makes it so popular. I think one of the other things that makes it quite popular is the fact that games can last really as little as 15 minutes. This is not dedicating three or four hours of your day like some other sports require. You can play as little as 15 minutes, a half an hour, and still enjoy several games. It's not cost prohibitive in that it requires very limited equipment. Um, people also get the, the buzz of early success when playing pickleball, that it doesn't require uh, a tremendous athletic background. So people can pick it up for the first time and within an hour are able to play games uh, amongst themselves. Uh, I actually ran some introductory clinics in Caledonia before the third wave. Uh, and within an hour, hour and a half, uh, they were set to just kind of play amongst themselves. Uh, and as far as I know, they were playing, they were continuing to play right up until they were shut down by, by the pandemic, unfortunately. But I, I actually ran into one of them recently and they're very eager to pick back up again. Uh, again, that early buzz of success. Uh, lastly, I think one of the other things that makes it quite popular is that there are a ton of breaks in play, right? At the end of every rally, there's a small break in play and the small court size actually makes it a very social game. So a little quick history in terms of pickleball in Nova Scotia was introduced here in 2013 in Halifax. Since then, it's expanded to be played in every single region of the province. Uh, it was introduced a year later in Bridgewater by four individuals who took it upon themselves to just begin playing amongst themselves at the Michelin Social Club. And from those four people and from word of mouth, it expanded to at least 250 people uh, in this community playing quite regularly. And not just has it expanded to 250 players, but amongst those 250 players are players who have medaled at national tournaments who have our multiple Atlantic Canadian champions. So not only do we boast a lot of players, we boast some players who play at, at a really high level competitively. The challenge, of course, with having that number of players is that we've kind of outgrown the, the facilities here that are offering pickleball. It's not uncommon to show up at a drop-in and find yourself waiting uh, to play as long as you're actually playing, uh, or to try to get a gym time and find that it's taken up by other players who want to play pickleball. Uh, the way that other communities in the province have addressed this is by building outdoor facilities. Um, despite Bridgewater being one of the first places in the province to play, we're still we're one of the last without uh, without outdoor courts uh, that are now being enjoyed in Amherst, Inigganish, Arisag, Bedford, Berwick, Cole Harbor, Dartmouth, Halifax, New Minas, Pugwash, Sackville, Shearwater, Sydney, Tantallon. That they're really being enjoyed. We actually have players here locally who travel quite regularly outside of our area just in order to participate in outdoor pickleball. So obviously pickleball is a very popular sport, but I think it actually fits perfectly with the community we have here in Bridgewater for a couple of reasons. One, uh, you know, the 2015 census shows that the average income in Bridgewater is about 47,000. That's about 14,000 below the provincial average. Pickleball, if a venue is provided, is an incredibly financially uh, uh, affordable sport uh, that you can basically four people can get in the equipment necessary to play for less than $60. And if a venue is provided, they can play to their heart's content for, for $60. Uh, there are other sports where you can't, you can't purchase a hockey stick for one person for $60. A family of four can play pickleball for $60 if a venue is provided to them. Uh, so it's not cost prohibitive. It doesn't rule people out about, based on their financial status. I think one of the other things besides just financial, in terms of our demographics age-wise, pickleball is perfect for our community. Uh, the social region of Nova Scotia, this is based on an article from the Globe and Mail in 2015. They actually list the social region of Nova Scotia as having the highest proportion of people age 60 plus in the entire country at nearly 33%. It's probably not a coincidence that pickleball has exploded here, uh, considering pickleball is ideal for people in that age range. USA Pickleball membership, 65% of their members are over 55 years old, right? This is a sport that is perfect for people in that age range. So why is this so popular amongst these individuals? It kind of touches on something I mentioned earlier, that, you know, in, in games can last 15 minutes, requires less stamina. Points themselves, 30 to 60 seconds. So it certainly requires less stamina. 
it gives an opportunity for quick breaks between play. Additionally, the game itself has some really unique rules that separate it from badminton, that separate it from tennis, that record, uh, require, uh, rewards shot selection and shot quality over sheer athleticism. This allows older adults to compete quite successfully with younger individuals. One of the things that I've enjoyed most about you know, myself uh, being introduced at pickleball is it allowed me to play you know, a competitive sport with my father, something that you simply can't do with a lot of other sports. Uh, in addition, like I'd mentioned earlier, it's played on a smaller court. This requires less mobility, which again puts people at less risk of injury while still benefiting from, from physical activity. Uh, I don't think it's going to be shocking to anybody here that regular exercise is an important part of positive aging. There's actually a study from the Harvard Health Journal specifically about the benefits of pickleball. And uh, they list things like cardiovascular health, bone health, uh, dexterity, mobility, agility, eye hand coordination, and balance as things that are significantly impacted in a positive manner from participation in pickleball. Last thing I'll mention in terms of why I think it, it fits so wonderfully uh, for our community in terms of our age demographics. And this is one that uh, hits very close to home for me as a therapist here in our community. I work for mental health and addictions. Uh, that research actually shows 40% of, of, of older adults, seniors, struggle with loneliness. We don't often think of loneliness as a social determinant of health, but research would suggest that uh, older adults who experience loneliness actually have a 26% higher mortality rate, which maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but it is quite substantial when you consider that that's equal to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Loneliness is a killer for older adults. Uh, how does that relate to pickleball? Well, pickleball, again, tremendously social sport. And that's really bared out by the fact that they actually, a recent uh, survey done by Pickleball Ontario, 50% of their members identified social connectedness as their favorite aspect of pickleball. Pickleball keeps these older adults connected with other members of their community in a really significant and important way. Uh, it's not surprising when you take that in mind that recent studies have shown that playing pickleball is significantly uh, linked to decreases in depression and anxiety and older adults. Which brings me to our proposal. Uh, you know, the Bridgewater Pickleball Club is really looking to, uh, to find ways to develop six public outdoor pickleball courts. Uh, six courts may sound like a lot, but let's keep in mind that that's equal to a little less than one and a half tennis courts. That right? it actually requires not a significant amount of, of space. Uh, you know, we have uh, talked to some uh, different contractors and the estimated cost would be about $250,000 and the benefits, you know, in addition to the things that we've already talked about, is that it would really uh, provide positive opportunities for positive aging for members of our community. Uh, it would increase growth uh, uh, of our local already established pickleball community and allow for uh, new members to potentially participate. It would allow for the development of youth programming as it relates to pickleball, which has really taken uh, really taken off in uh, throughout the U.S. And I think one of the, the most significant things is it would allow for for uh, the hosting of large events and tournaments that would bring people to our community, uh, whether it's from uh, other areas of the province or from outside the province. So that's that's all I have to say about that. I can unshare if you'd like, if I can figure that out. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Jared. Uh, questions from members of council? Make sure you use the raised hand function there or raise your hand. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Tanner, you had a question. Sorry. Uh, Jared, two questions for you. Uh, one, I'm under the understanding that the um, the local pickleball club isn't that eager to become an association or a registered organization. And, and I guess that sort of would uh, would limit your ability to access funds and, and so on on your own and perhaps another revenue source for building this thing. Uh, and then two, um, I know there was a bit of back and forth at the local tennis club and I know the local tennis club was thinking about um, expanding and, and not expanding, but relocating at Generations Active Park. And, and now I guess that's sort of paused a bit, but like why can't there be more synergies there to, uh, to actually utilize, you know, that space or whatever space that might be if they ever move. So 
two questions for you, sorry. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I can touch on the first one. Um, I can't speak to the uh, general uh, overall interest in terms of forming uh, a formal association, but I do know that uh, it has been established, uh, that we are now a formal established association uh, that has a membership being built, that we recognize that I think that is an imperative part uh, of accessing grants towards um, uh, funding the construction of this sort of, of project. Uh, and uh, I think part of the, the, the one of the obstacles has been uh, people's lack of understanding in terms of the benefits of doing that, right? Uh, I think it's just a matter of providing increased education uh, as to why we would want to uh, formally uh, create an association. In terms of the second question, um, it, yes, pickleball is generally played on a similar surface to a, a tennis court. Um, but the sizes are such that it makes it very challenging to host them at the same site. Um, that you either share the net and use the same net, which is of a different height. Uh, you're essentially changing the dynamics of pickleball to use the tennis net, or you are not using the tennis net, you're using it a barrier to separate courts, in which case your courts are going to be so close together that they become actually hazardous uh, and dangerous to be used. Uh, we have seen it used at some facilities uh, where they have used the net, lowered it, but it still limits the effectiveness in terms of uh, it doesn't have fencing where you would require fencing for pickleball because they're built for a tennis sized court. Um, so there are drawbacks to trying to combine the two, uh, which either is going to hamper tennis play or hamper pickleball play. And I, I think the challenge is going to, or is always going to be that if you develop one of these facilities, you want it to be used nonstop. And if you build a facility that doesn't really meet the needs of either place, neither of them are going to be used to their full potential. And I think that's been the challenge with potentially combining the two. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Councillor Caldwell, you were next. Yes, I'm wondering if you have any um, cost share um, proposal regarding, um, you know, breakdown of, you know, grants, other municipal partners, fundraising. Um, do you have anything like that? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, you cut out for a second for me. I'm wondering if you have any cost share proposal between, uh, say, grants, fundraising, uh, other municipal partners, that type of thing. Uh, not not at present that that we're really looking for uh, that we, we certainly have looked into uh, the available grants uh, that would be potentially available to us that we we have spoken to other communities that have built pickleball courts to get a sense of uh, how they've managed to do it. I mean, there's certainly no shortage of of uh, other people's brains to pick around that um, right now we are still kind of in the stage of figuring out um, what kind of support we would get from our local governance in trying to put this sort of project together. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McDonald, you had your hand up next. So I was feeling kind of bad for you coming in tonight to tonight, Jared, because uh, we, we get a lot of requests, you know, tennis I know. courts, beach volleyball, splash pads, and usually it involves sweet little children with big eyes. And I thought, how is Jared going to match up? But your your presentation was fantastic, very informative, a lot of really useful information. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask around locations. So I, I've, I've heard that maybe you've been looking around the LCLC, uh, maybe Generations Active Park. Are those actual locations that, that you're considering um, as viable locations? Are there others? Uh, those are certainly uh, locations that we've looked at. Uh, again, at this point, uh, we are really just kind of looking to see what uh, would be viable. Uh, yeah, that, that we, we certainly have not uh, zeroed in, in on, on a specific location as, as the most reasonable. 
Did you have a follow up? If you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so there's no very specific requirements. You just need a flat piece of land where you can build courts. There's no, I, I don't know, direction of the sun or anything. <laughs> yes, actually, the one thing I'll say is that when it, when it comes to court construction, it is very important that they are built, I believe, north-south as opposed to east-west uh, in order so that at certain times of the day, they become virtually, they actually built really lovely courts in Dunbrack and Halifax that are built in the wrong direction. And for a period of about six hours a day, they are unusable uh, due to the sun. Uh, so yeah, yeah that, that is something that we need to take into oh. consideration in terms of kind of the way that they would be oriented. So we would need a certain amount of space, but that space would have to be in a specific layout. Uh, the only other consideration that I think would need to be uh, really mindful, that we need to be mindful of, would be that it, it is somewhere that has, I don't want to say ample cover, but some wind cover, uh, that it's not on top of like a hill or it's not, not directly next to, you know, the ocean. Uh, that uh, again, we, we if, if we're going to build something of that nature, we want it to be, uh, you know, obviously very user friendly and something that everybody can enjoy to the best of their abilities. Uh, Councilor Torbert, you had your hand up. Did you call me? Uh, yeah, you have your hand up. Yeah, I did, but I thought you was going to share first. But anyway, uh, thanks, Jared. Uh, we did uh, contact both parks and rec departments early on, and we did uh, hope that uh, Town of Bridgewater and MODL would get together and we would make one set of course that could be shared with both groups to cut the cost down. And we did work with the LCLC because that seemed like the best location that would provide parking, uh, washroom facilities, uh, and just a good place to have that court. We did uh, less than a month ago form uh, association with joint stocks. So we are up and running, but uh, we was hoping that the town of Bridgewater and MODL would come together because we know that there's only sufficient funds there and it would be a shame if either or wouldn't be partners in something that is available to everyone. Uh, the tennis court actually uh, are, is quite busy in Bridgewater and I don't think there's enough time or space for active pickleball due to the number of members and the way that it's grown. So uh, I'm, I'm, I don't, because like Jared said, it, it's so many obstacles there, the net's too high, you can't go around that. It really inhibits the play of the pickleball club. But uh, they are now playing uh, para pickleball, as you may have heard me say. And uh, we do have a para ice surface. And I thought it would be amazing if the Bridgewater uh, MODL pickleball courts or the South Shore pickleball courts could incorporate that so that we could have para pickleball in our South Shore area. As a matter of fact, I think that the deaf are starting to play pickleball. Yeah. Different rules, but they're playing and it involves so many people. And pickleball is meant to be an outdoor sport. I could talk about this for hours because I'm passionate and I've won a few medals for both the national and provincial and Atlantic, but I'll, I'll turn it back to you guys. So, but we are working on to it. We just need a municipal unit or units to step up and say, yes, we support it and give us a path going forward. So we need some clear direction of what the intent of both municipal units is. Because there's no sense us banging on somebody's door if our municipal units don't support what we're doing. We need that support up front to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jerry, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you, Jared, for the informative presentation. Um, and I was just, I know you talked about uh, the cost measures and it being a, a sport um, for all families and very much affordable. I'm just curious as um, you reached out to the other communities that have had uh, or built courts, 
do, do you get a cost uh, estimate as to the what the ongoing uh, annual costs are to to maintain them as well? Yep, that uh, generally speaking, you can go about ten years before any additional costs need to go into it. Uh, that uh, most of the facilities require zero upkeep since that they have been put into service. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I think is really great is that there's only one actually pickleball facility in the province that is not just a publicly run pickleball facility that is a, a members club that you have to pay to use. Everyone is just simply a public court. Mm -hmm. uh, and that they've required very little upkeep. It's essentially at the beginning of the season, the Parks and Rec Department take the nets back out of storage, hang them up, hang up their windscreens, and then they take them down in the fall. And that's really all that's been required. Uh, when there has been minor things needed, if they need a bench, if they need a new windscreen, the local players essentially run a tournament. Uh, and I've ran, I think, four provincial championships now in an Atlantics. Uh, and that money goes back into paying for any sort of those small sort of repairs that you need. Uh, any sort of major resurfacing is years down the road. Uh, I would say a minimum of 10 years, but you're mm -hmm. probably looking at quite substantially longer than that before it would require resurfacing. Okay. So I know that... Um... You made this presentation at MODL and uh, it was well received and, and I agree it was a it was a great presentation. So thanks. Lots of information. Um, what I'm what I'm still unclear on is is what is actually the ask. So is it for the whole 250,000 for the land, the ongoing operating costs, the maintenance or um, is a is like a formal request going to be coming to both councils and maybe the LCLC as a I'm just I'm not saying this is the location, but just throwing this out as an example. You know, we'd like to request that the lower parking lot at the LCLC be made into pickleball courts. We're able to fundraise for 10% asking for the remaining 90 to be divided by the other three entities, if you include the LCLC. There's a whole bunch of questions. Like I keep going, have you gone to Mahone Bay, town of Lunenburg? <laughs> Uh, will there be no, dues? No, it, All great, great questions, great questions. And it, you know, in fairness to you, um, I didn't probably express that particularly well because this isn't my world either, right? Uh, I'm passionate about pickleball. I'm a mental health therapist. I know very little about about you know uh, local governance and 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 things like that. To to be quite frank, uh, what we're looking for is to get all the potential parties together to sit down and have a conversation around what would be required of the association. Uh, you know, we are actively looking at fundraising opportunities. We're certainly not looking for local governments and, and grants to provide us the entire amount. Like we recognize that that's probably not feasible. We are looking at fundraising opportunities. Obviously we've been held back a little bit by the pandemic and that certainly there are a lot of things we would like to do. Uh, for instance, I had a tournament that was going to raise about between five and $7,000 this summer. Uh, specifically towards this cause that's been canceled because of the pandemic. Um, but uh, it would be about getting all of the potential parties who could contribute to uh, the development of this sort of project getting together uh, so that we can figure out the specifics around whether it's around location, whether it's around applying for grants, whether it's around uh, you know the funding opportunities. I guess that at this point, that's what we're asking for. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Thurman. Yeah, we just need, need a starting point, and we was hoping that uh, by presenting to both councils that you could have a discussion jointly and kind of give us some direction on what would be the best approach. Do we just come to Bridgewater and forget them ODL and try and do it and report directly to the Bridgewater Council? Or do we go to MODL and Bridgewater and hopefully have a facility uh, that is a perfect location close to the new interchange? And anybody traveling today, 
if you go on any pickleball site, they want to know where the pickleball courts are. It will bring people here. That's their first question. If you haven't got the courts, they're going to say bye bye Bridgewater and go where they are. And, 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 and if you go on there, you'll, you'll find that quite obvious. But I guess what we need is somebody to get together to support us, and then we can meet with both groups or the LCLC as a group and find out what's expected of us so we can start moving the process forward. We did go and meet in uh, November, December with both rec groups, but they couldn't do anything until councils uh, made a decision on what was going to happen. So until councils give us some path, we're just sitting here grinding our wheels. There's nothing we can do. So it sounds to me like the natural the natural next step is probably to to have a conversation with the LCLC board, which which by its very makeup brings together the two councils in the same room. Um, if that is a, if that is a desired option for a site, if it's not, then it makes sense to just bring the two councils together, I guess. Tammy, I see you have your hand up. I was waiting till you were like yeah. turned away and then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was just going to say maybe um, in addition to perhaps confirming with the LCLC that, you know, they're open and receptive to that site. It sounds like uh, there's a provincial department, uh, heritage and culture that uh, deals in recreation facility grants. Um, we have uh, staff here that could sit down with modal and members from the association and just kind of perhaps give some guidance and, and brain, brainstorm on funding opportunities that could, could help um, in terms of raising the capital, at least to put together a plan for here's how much we think might be possible to to get through grants, and here's here's the gap that's remaining, here's how much we think we could fundraise, maybe give them a little bit of guidance on what that would look like to come back to the council and, and kind of present what now we know, now we see the picture, here's the ask, here's what we need from you. Uh, Councillor Thorburn. Yeah, it, it's a great time, Tammy, too, because this is all about accessibility. And we know what the ruling from the province has just come out with and what we have to do going forward. And I'm quite sure that dealing with accessibility, there'd be some grants there that would help us, especially with this pair of project for, for that, because uh, I, I think that would help. So Deputy Mayor Tanner, as chair of the, of the LCLC board, um, would you think that this would, the natural next step would be to bring this to the board to start having that discussion in terms of the feasibility of that? site yeah you uh, interrupted me typing an email so yes <laughs> yeah okay so i think that that's probably because we know this needs to be in partnership with our with our municipal neighbors um and because this this takes in the whole region right you can all the the 250 members that you mentioned are not all from the town of bridgewater they're not all from the municipality district of lunenburg um so i think we all need to be kind of all hands on deck with that. The LCLC naturally brings that synergy together. So uh, Deputy Mayor can finish typing his email to, uh, and, and take that to, to that next step. Are there other questions from members of council? Obviously after, after that, we'll have a report back to council um, uh, to see where this goes from there. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Jared, again for your great presentation and your answers to, your, to our questions. Terrific. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Okay. Have a good night. Thanks. You guys as well. Bye. Uh, our next item was uh, the minutes of the May 25th, uh, 2021 council meeting. Are there any errors or omissions, deletions there? Hearing now, uh, Councillor Caldwell. Yes, uh, I noted the item uh, 10.3, the spacing is a little wonky, same with 10.4, and 10.4 also uh, is a little confusing at the end. I think it was cut off. Okay. The, the content, there's no issues with the content, though, but just if we correct the spacing, then you go with that? And the, I think 10.4 at the it's, end, it's, it's uh, I think it's cut off. Something a little confused. 
Oh, the lease of uh, of the fire truck. Yes. Okay. We're just reading it now, trying to figure out where it's cut off. Sandra has just messaged. She will take a she will take a look at that, and we will correct that as uh, as needed. Um, why don't we circle back to this one, and we'll just see if there's something obvious that we can. If there's something missing, we'll fix it, and then we can approve the minutes later. Okay. So we'll go into planning items. Uh, first one is development agreement for 333 King Street and rescheduling the public hearing. Um, I don't know if there's any additional information on that. Are we just giving notice that we're rescheduling the public hearing? To June 9th and 16th. No, that's the those are the dates they advertise. The public hearing is June 28th. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So this is just to advise the public that the uh, public hearing for 333 King Street. Um, the next one will be held uh, June 28th, 2021. Uh, and I'm assuming that will be um, virtual. Well, it'll be in council, but members of the public can attend virtually um, if required. Okay. Next item is land use bylaw amendments for urban commercial C3 zone. Um, this is just that there is no requirement for a uh, public participation meeting. I don't know if staff, someone's going to just quickly explain that or I can. So I can quickly explain that um, uh, as, as the planner on file for that one. Uh, so uh, because the C3 uh, amendment is a housekeeping amendment, uh, there's no requirement to uh, uh, have hold a, a public participation meeting uh, for for that. Uh, but we'd originally uh, uh, put in the memo that we would hold a public participation meeting. So we're just uh, redacting that statement. Any questions on that, staff? Okay, and our next item is uh, application for land use bylaw amendment rezoning of 677 LaHave Street. Nelson again? Yes, so I'm going to uh, pop back on your screens uh, to give you a quick overview of the application briefing uh, for a proposed rezoning at 677 LaHave Street. Uh, so if you can see my screen, yeah. Great. Okay. So I'm actually one second. So I've I've put together a presentation for a certain segment uh, of uh, I've put together slides for a certain segment of the presentation today. Uh, but I'm just going to give you a little bit, little bit of background uh, prior to that. And we now uh, lost, uh, lost your screen there, Nelson. Oh, yeah, I, I'm going to pull it up at a, a later point. Uh, okay. I'm just going to read from some notes uh, on my screen um, for the first portion of the presentation. Um, so the town received an application on May 12th uh, for rezoning at the property located at 677 LaHave Street. The property is currently zoned general commercial, uh, C5 zoning, and the owners are requesting uh, to rezone the property to two unit residential, which is R2. The intent is to enable the subdivision of three separate lots for single unit dwellings or uh, two unit developments. Uh, that would be in a second stage uh, of the development process. Uh, so right now we're really just concerned uh, with the change in, in land use uh, from general commercial to uh, two unit residential. Uh, to give you a little, little bit of context uh, on the site. So the site is located uh, on La Have Street uh, and it abuts the La Have River. Uh, for those of you who were here in 2010, the property was formerly the site of the Krauss and Choate warehouse. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, but it's currently uh, vacant as the structure was demolished uh, in 2010. Uh, the surrounding zoning is single unit residential uh, with a little, little bit of uh, general commercial uh, across the street uh, and some park space as well as uh, R7, which is residential manufactured home. Uh, the surrounding land uses include existing single unit residential and mixed use commercial. Uh, Helping Nature Heal uh, is located there. 
Uh, and across the street is the former Ben's Bakery outlet, uh, which is also zoned uh, general commercial. Uh, the future land use designation for the site is low density residential, uh, as is most of the surrounding area with a little bit of high density residential uh, and some open space nearby. Um, so this is the part where I'm going to pull up uh, some slides. Um, so the area, the, the, the property is in the La Have, um River Development Agreement area. Uh, and so uh, due to some recent news items that came out um, in an adjacent uh, municipality, I just want to provide a little bit of clarity on what that uh, what what being uh, adjacent to the La Have River means for this property. Um, so uh, the application uh, at this stage only proposes a change in, in use, so it doesn't require a development agreement uh, at this stage. Um, but if the, the the landowner chooses to develop the property uh, or construct a, a building on the property, then they would be required to go through a development uh, agreement process. Uh, and so what this means um, uh, is that it would have to adhere to, uh, uh, the development agreement would have to adhere, adhere to policies laid out in the La Have River development agreement area. Uh, so this, uh, overlay uh, was was established in 2014 uh, in the municipal planning strategy uh, and it adds additional regulations on development that um, uh, abuts the river uh, or is close to the river um, and so uh, should the, the owner of the property go forward with any kind of development um, uh, there would be different measures put in place in the development agreement uh, to ensure mitigation of, of certain flood risk uh, or, or erosion um, and council would have to refer to the integrated river uh, coastal hydrodynamic flood risk mapping uh, study, uh, which um, was a study conducted in 2013, which informed the development of the La Have area, uh, development agreement area. Uh, and uh, so that would essentially give council, council a chance to, to look at different aspects of the property that could be implicated by uh, a flood um, or, or any risk that the, the river might pose to the development. Um, and so just to make it really clear, uh, this development isn't at that stage yet, um, but staff just wants to bring um, you know, that awareness to council um, as part of this application. Uh, so that is pretty much all I have uh, as we're at the application uh, briefing phase. Um, I will be coming to council um, uh, at a later date for a planning analysis report where we'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail. Uh, on uh, some of the analysis behind uh, the the application. Um, the public participation meeting is scheduled for June 23rd for this application. Um, and uh, post the planning application or planning analysis report, uh, there will be a public hearing uh, where council will give a final consideration uh, on the application. So that's all I have for presentation. Um, and I can open the floor for, uh, for any questions you might have. Thank you, Nelson. Questions from members of council on that? Council for some further information. Councilor Thorburn. Yes, uh, that has been known to be a flood area. It's flooded a couple of times, especially uh, in the spring thaw when the bridge burn near went out. And that street was flooded uh, quite extensively. Is there any precautions going to be taken there? So there'd be some mediation if a flood would occur. I do know on the west side of the river where the old car wash was, uh, there was something that had to be done there because of that flooding risk. And I was just wondering what uh, would be done on the other side, on the east side. Yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, so according to the flood risk map, uh, this property has about a 65% chance of being flooded uh, in, in, the, in, in the instance where there's a, a big flood. Um, uh, in the next hundred years, uh, and so uh, I, I just want to reiterate that at, at this stage in the development process, because we're just uh, looking at a change in land use, uh, where you know there's no requirement uh, for the property owner to to actually put in place any flood mitigation measures. Um, but should the the landowner uh, decide to subdivide and then uh, build any kind of structure on the site? Uh, then they'd have to go through a development agreement process. Uh, and if they did that, uh, then they'd have to adhere to, to certain policies laid out in the, the municipal planning strategy related to the uh, La Have River uh, development agreement area. 
uh, which include things like doing, uh, looking at the, the study that was done um, and, you know, putting in place uh, different kinds of landscaping, uh, uh, doing kinds, kind, different kinds of geotechnical work uh, uh, to make sure that all the structures would be uh, safe in, in the instance of a, of a flood. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, yeah, but that, that uh, really is, is kind of a, a, another stage of the development process uh, to this one. Um, Great, thanks. Other questions? All right, hearing none. Thank you, Nelson, for that. It's great. We're going down to correspondence for action. We have a letter from the the uh, a request from the president of the Lunenburg Amateur Radio Club, uh, request to waive the annual fee. Um, so, as we know, we have uh, a radio tower, and um, currently the the plan is that those who are tenants on the tower. Uh, pay a fee. So this request has come. I don't know if staff have any additional comment on that. Um, yeah, CAL. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Al had asked that I uh, just speak to it briefly about the rationale for why they were asking for the request to waive the fee. And it's primarily as this tower functions as a backup for radio communications and would provide coverage for the town as well as some surrounding areas outside of the town in the event of an emergency and perhaps equipment failure at the um, power and modal. And council had considered a report by, by staff where we, we indicated that we had a number of uh, pieces of equipment that were co-located on the tower. Um, there is a cost to the town to, to erect this tower and, and council had identified that uh, or directed the staff to uh, negotiate um, lease, leases with those users. So this, this would be one of those. So um, in waiving this, um, there would be an implication in terms of the cost to be recovered from the other user, which is why the recommended motion is that you refer that to staff to um, bring back kind of what the, what the potential impact could be um, with, the, with that loss be absorbed by the other tenants or would we would it be a true waiving of fees that would be just recovered through our own general revenue? Yeah, because there's a bit of a cascade effect here. If if, yeah. if one person isn't paying, then the cost is cost doesn't go down. Yeah. Any questions from council? Someone prepared to make a motion, please. Council McDonald. I actually have a question. Oh yeah, sure, fire away. In, in uh, assuming we're, we're sending it to, to staff for some uh, feedback, I'd also like to know not just the impact on the cost, but they, they're talking about acting as a backup service. And if that's a service that we require, do we not have any backup service in place if, if they don't provide that? Um, and what the impact would be if we didn't have them available to provide that? My, my understanding is that is the backup. So um, um, it and it, it's uh, primarily a benefit to the town in terms of communication. So, but we can we can let you know what happens if that equipment's not located there. Thank you, uh, Councilor Thorburn. Yes, Tammy. Have we heard back from the, any other uh, people that's going on that tower? Any feedback? Any replies? Uh, or is this the first one? I. I'm not too sure if Larry's here, if he would know or not. Um, if not, we can get, I know Graham is working on that. So he's supposed to be bringing a report once he's had a chance to um, discuss the associated costs with the potential um, user. Because that's really going to affect the cost of that. If a couple more drop off, then, then we really have to have a good discussion on how we're going to recoup to, to yep. pay for it. Okay. Yeah, which is, is part of the rationale for referring it to staff so we can we can do that. And some of those conversations were in, in camera conversations under negotiations as well. So we'd want to probably keep them there. Well, and, and to Councillor McDonald's point, if if there are a backup, there, I'm assuming there's there is a value to us. Uh, and then what is the cost? What is the, the financial value that we get when we have a backup that we can use? So there's got to be something there. Okay, uh, so looking for a motion to refer this to staff, and then we'll come back with, with some additional information. Deputy Mayor Tanner. 
I move that Council for the Town of Bridgewater refer the request from the Lunenburg Amateur Radio Club to staff to review and advise as to the implications in considering the club's request to raise the fees, to waive the fees <laughs> for inclusion <laughs> <and> location agreements. <laughs> For use of the new tower on Aberdeen Road, as per Council's previous direction from an in-camera meeting held on March 8th, 2021. Thank you. Second by. I'll second Council the motion. Fugier, thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, motion is carried. Um, and I the problem with virtual meetings the flow of these doesn't <laughs> doesn't go the way i i like it so i i was very remiss uh for not mentioning the orange ribbons that uh councillor caldwell and councillor mcdonald are wearing i don't know if anyone else uh deputy mayor tanner and <laughs> councillor thorward i uh mine are at home um so as we as we lowered the flag to um remembrance of the 215 Children who were found at the residential school in Kamloops, um, the orange ribbon is also uh, in um, in memory of those and all the victims of the residential school. Uh, and so, thank you for thank you to Councillor Caldwell for uh, bringing that uh, the ribbons to our attention, and Councillor McDonald for going out and um, getting them. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's heartbreaking, heartbreaking. I just. Uh, I don't really have any words to describe that. So um, thank you for wearing your ribbons. Uh, in terms of the minutes, the minutes that we had some issues with uh, at the top of the meeting, we will those will come back at the uh, June 28th um, meeting with, uh, with the corrections made. So thank you for that. Um, reports and recommendations. We have the um, discussion session from June 7th briefing notes there. Um, I actually had a comment from uh, someone who reads the agenda package who appreciated uh, the briefing notes. So that's a, that's a step, so that's good. Any questions or comments on those? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to FCM funding update and amendment to the PACE program service agreement with Clean Foundation. And there is Mr. DeVried. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor members of council. Um, uh, I just have a very quick walkthrough for you of this report, and then I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, so uh, the backbone of this report is uh, very good news. Uh, the town was successful in co-applying together with Clean Foundation and a number of uh, partner municipalities on the FCM, so Federation of Canadian Municipalities Community Efficiency Financing Program. Uh, this was approved by town council for application on June 22nd, 2020, came back to council uh, on July 14th for a uh, in-kind contribution from the town's end to support the, uh, the funding and financing. And uh, I'm very pleased to report that as a result uh, of this, uh, the town uh, is now able to um, access over $5 million in FCM funding and financing to support uh, what will eventually be part of the Energize Bridgewater program um, in order to make home energy retrofits um, more affordable and easier to access for Bridgewater residents. Um, so uh, right off the bat, I do need to say that uh, FCM has not made its announcement yet. And so uh, this information is coming to you, but it's not something that we can actually broadcast kind of in an announcement kind of way, you know, putting it on our um, uh, Facebook channel and, and so on. It's really something that's just being brought to you for your awareness because there is a contractual uh, component that uh, staff is recommending uh, town council um, uh, work with. Uh, specifically, uh, the report uh, provides a number of things that are now possible through the town's uh, property assessed clean energy financing program. Uh, the ones that relate to the updates that relate to uh, the, 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 the resolution that's recommended for this evening on the contract is that as a result of the, uh, the funding and financing from Clean Foundation, uh, sorry, from FCM, uh, Clean Foundation, our program administrator is able to drop 
the program participation fees down to $100 per participating uh, household, which is great. So Bridgewater residents um, can experience uh, 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 program participation fees, administrative fees at less than a quarter uh, of what they have been uh, prior to this time. And in addition to that, um, uh, Clean Foundation has received as part of its uh, contribution from FCM uh, substantial uh, marketing uh, 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 marketing dollars, and so they are able to allocate uh, marketing support valued at over $130,000 to Bridgewater over the four, next four years for program awareness and support. So this is great. It dovetails very well with the Energize Bridgewater program's intention to uh, market our program offering to Bridgewater residents, and we will work very cleanly, uh, very cleanly, very closely with Clean Foundation to uh, make sure that those messages are aligned and that people are being brought into the program and, and that the program is being marketed to them in a way that makes sense to local residents, keeping in mind that not all parts of the program um, are going to be active at the same time. So we're in a development process here and we're going to be doing some piloting and building up the program over time. But this is an important piece. Um, so with this financing and funding now in place, uh, the, the staff team here in, in, uh, at Bridge, uh, Town Hall and with our project partners can move forward with the finalization of the Energized Bro uh, Bridgewater program design and specifically uh, uh, some of the lending terms and contractual details of the program that will be made available to Bridgewater residents uh, with this important um, offering in place, um, I think we can uh, now expect to put forward a very um, uh, uh, competitive, I'll use that word, uh, uh, offering for, for residents, including very low interest rates um, on, the, uh, on the, the PACE financing, significantly lower than anything we've offered to date, um, as well as the opportunity, as it says here in the uh, in the staff report, to even couple those with some uh, um, uh, some incentives that are in additional to incentives that uh, 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 Bridgewater residents may otherwise be able to access on the market. Uh, long amortization period, uh, uh, 10, 15 years plus, uh, which would result in very low uh, monthly payments on, um, on any financing through the town. And of course, any of those changes would be brought to council for approval and discussion prior to enacting any any further changes to the program. So all we're really trying to do here uh, with this initial recommendation is to make a, a two modifications to our service agreement with Clean Foundation so that they can begin offering the lower administrative cost to Bridgewater residents, basically effective, you know, as soon as we can get the contract executed, um, as well as to take advantage of their marketing dollars. So we can hopefully get some more participation in the program starting this summer and fall. Um, the, the documentation there is that there is an amendment number one uh, to the agreement for services, and that agreement for services was signed with Clean Foundation on uh, in 2017, and lasts for uh, another uh, uh, 15 months or so. I think the end date is September 2022 uh, for that contract, and we'll be reviewing that contract over the coming months as well. Uh, but we really felt that it was. Um, uh, prudent to provide Bridgewater residents with opportunities, especially for the lower uh, program administration fees, which are written into the contract and so need to be amended. Um, a couple of, uh, you know, uh, uh, programmatic changes are still coming. So uh, uh, we, we do advise that council is aware of some of the, you know, risks, I guess you could say, for uh, executing a, a, a programmatic um, uh, contract amendment at this point, but we feel that the risk is fairly low and um, uh, can be taken in stride. Uh, just a reminder that um, you know this this uh, recommendation means reduced program fees for uh, Bridgewater Pace uh, program clients, uh, but that beyond this, there's really uh, little direct impact to the town's finances and budget uh, because um, uh, funding for Pace. Uh, in addition to the town's annual commitment of $100,000 in, in, in financing, is can now come from, um, uh, from FCM uh, through the Municipal Finance Corporation. Um, happy to answer any questions you may have about the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. This is good news. I'm, I'm looking forward to when it can be 
officially announced, although <laughs> the cat's kind of out of the bag now, uh, Deputy Mayor Tanner. Well, and I hope you are working cleanly as well. I know that was a <laughs> bit of a... Um, just a quick question on the uh, the hundred dollar fees. So, uh, and again, this is a meaty topic. I may have lost it, uh, on a couple of other presentations, but is there the option to waive that hundred dollar fee for low income applications or whatever the case may be, and or roll that hundred dollar fee into part of the amortization process? Um, so we have not yet had. Uh, conversation on the idea of waiving the fee. Um, that is something that I can take back as a question to Clean Foundation to see uh, their thoughts on that. It's not something that, um, you know, we've, we've I think, really had a serious conversation about at the town and, and it would likely require town council approval uh, for that. So we could, we could bring that uh, forward as a, something to consider. Uh, but the great news is that um, the fees have always been able to be amortized. So uh, all program administration costs can simply be rolled into the to the financing from the town. And the vision again for the program is that um, it's uh, that that any resident that takes part in the program is cash flow positive starting in year one. And that that's a, a major uh, design um, uh, criterion of the program and something that, uh, 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 you know, uh, we will be maintaining and even strengthening that ability now with the uh, the lower interest rates and um, uh, potentially longer amortization period. Yeah. But I can get I can I can uh, investigate the option to to waive the fees. Other questions, Talion. Someone prepared to make a motion, please. <laughs> Quite well, thank you. I'll, I'll make the motion, Your Worship. There you go. Okay. All right. I would move that Council for the Town of Bridgewater direct staff to execute the proposed amendment number one, the agreement for services as contained in document 20-118D, enacting changes to the agreement for services dated May the 11th, 2017, between the Town of Bridgewater and Clean Foundation. Thank you. Seconded by. I'll second that. No, nope, Deputy Mayor Tanner was first up with his hands. Uh, further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, Leon, for that. Uh, next item is 9.3. Uh, we're giving notice to pol policy 57, the low income tax exemption policy, some proposed amendments and um, some changes there that come with uh, council had some, um, after we raised the residential tax rates, we wanted to make sure we lessen the impact as much as possible for um, lower income residents. So I know that uh, that's what this is. I don't know, Ms. Crabber, if you have any additional information other than um, that? Um, no, and Kim's, Kim's here as well, but really it's to give notice that at the next council meeting, you'll be having a, considering and debating the, the merits of the policy and, and consideration for approval. That would be at the June 28th council yeah. session. Okay. So that'll come back in uh, in two weeks. Is someone prepared to make a motion? Councillor Caldwell? I move the town council for the town of Bridgewater give notice pursuant to section 48 of the Municipal Government Act at the June 28, 2021 council meeting Amendments to Policy 57, low income tax exemption, will be considered to enable an increase in property tax exemption amounts. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor McDonald. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, next item is flare stack replacement emergency funding. I don't like the emergency funding part, but I tell you that wastewater treatment plant has the coolest parts, like the names flare stack, anaerobic digester. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, just trying to lighten what is uh, unfortunately uh, not a cheap fix, but I'll turn it over to, to Audrey to run us through this. Good evening, everyone. 
Um, this evening, we're here to request emergency funding to replace the existing 30 year old flare stack at the wastewater treatment plant. For those that aren't aware, the flare stack is used to burn excess methane gas from the wastewater treatment process. It produces um, methane gas daily as part of the organic breakdown process, and it is used currently to heat our facility and the digester. But sometimes of the year, we don't um, need as much heat as others, so we do uh, generate excess methane gas from the process, and this gas must be uh, burnt in the flare stack in order to release it as a, a safe product and not a greenhouse gas into the environment. So it is critical to meeting our targets to make sure that we put it through the flare stack process before we release it to the environment. Our flare stack started failing a couple of months ago probably due to its age. Uh, we brought on site certified technicians and the fuel safety uh, representatives. They assessed the current unit and advised us that uh, it cannot be certified in its current state because it can't be grandfathered in due to its age and the number of items that are no longer in compliance with current um, standards. So the most economical fix is a full replacement and currently there are not a lot of parts available due to its age. So in order to ensure continued operation, we would like the um, ability to fund a full replacement of it as soon as possible. So we're here this evening asking uh, to use wastewater capital reserves to fund this and try and complete uh, the upgrades in this fiscal year at a co an estimated cost of $270,000 plus HST. Thank you. Questions from Council on this? It's pretty straightforward. Council Thorburn? Yes, Audrey. Was that in the capital budget and what year was it in there? Or was something that wasn't identified before? We didn't have it identified in the next 10 years, so it, it is in addition to the capital budget. Okay, thank you. Uh, just along those lines, are there um are there parts that are still that old that remain on that in that facility that perhaps we should revisit to make sure um like if they're not on the capital plan or if they're at the end of the 10-year capital plan but these parts are 30 years old is there anything else left the majority of the plant is still 30 years old and we have most of it in the next 10 years we have it sort of um brought in as as we can acquire funding but both the pumping stations and the, the treatment plant are all 30 years old so it, we're trying to cover them as quickly as we can okay any, any other questions someone prepared to make a motion i'll make a motion Councilor Fugier, thank you yes uh I move that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorse staff's recommendation to replace the player stack at an estimated cost of 270000 plus HST using wastewater capital mm -hmm. reserves to fund this unbudgeted item as outlined in document 21-076. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Coughlin. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Audrey. Our next item is, uh, we get these every month, it's the Lunenburg County uh, Senior Safety Program, uh, the May 2021 report. Um, busy group of people, uh, very much trying to take care of uh, the seniors in our region and um, yeah, so we can't thank them enough. Every month we get these reports. I, I would encourage the public to read through that. If council has any questions, they can reach out to the team and, um, and uh, they'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, item 9.6 is temporary borrowing resolution. And uh, I know our uh, director of finance is here. Um, and perhaps uh, before we uh, vote on this. Maybe Kim can just uh, run us through this for the sake of the public. 
All right. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. All right, perfect. Um, so this is our annual temporary boring resolution. And so this boring resolution essentially allows us to finance um, this year's capital projects in the long term, but it also allows us, if necessary, um, to do some short term borrowing. So as you can see, it's uh, just a little over $2 million. So that allows us to you know, use a line of credit or any other temporary borrowing we might need until we can actually get our long-term debt in place when the asset's finished. Um, and so it serves two purposes. However, it doesn't give us, you know, the ability to go long-term finance this without bringing it back to council um, just one more time so that you can see what projects we actually have to borrow for. If we were to happen to get other financing or the project comes in under budget, then our borrowing would be a bit less. So an example of that is that we estimate the required PACE financing would be $150,000. Uh, we don't know until the PACE projects are completed how much each individual pre-approval will be. So that one's estimated. The rest are in line with the capital budget. I hit the wrong button. <laughs> Any questions? No, yeah, someone. You ready for a motion? Yes, I was waiting for you. Where is? <laughs> uh, where is section 66 of the Municipal Government Act provides that council of the town of Bridgewater, subject to the approval of the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, may borrow to expend funds for a capital purpose as authorized by stature, whereas the council for the town of Bridgewater has adopted a capital budget for the physical year as required by section five of the Municipal Government Act and are so authorized to expend funds for capital purposes as identified in the capital budget and whereas the specified amounts and descriptions of the project are contained in Schedule A. Be it therefore resolved that under the authority of section 66 of the Municipal Government Act, the council of the town of Bridgewater borrow a sum or sums not exceeding $2,165,000 for the purposes set out above, subject to the approval of the Minister or Municipal Affairs and Housing, that the sums be borrowed by the issue and sale of debentures of the Council of the Town of Bridgewater to such an amount as the Council deems necessary, that the issue of debentures be postponed pursuant to Section 92 of the Municipal Government Act, and that the sum or sums not exceeding $2,165,000 in total be borrowed from time to time from any chartered bank or trust company doing business in Nova Scotia, that the sums be borrowed for a period not exceeding 12 months from the date of the approval of the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing of this resolution, that the interest payable on the borrowing be paid at a rate to be agreed upon, and that the amount borrowed be repaid from the proceeds of the, the debentures when sold. Thank you very much. Seconded by Councilor Fragier. Discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, we have another uh, 9.7 is uh, another notice um, on the routine, uh, proposed routine access policy. Um, so I'm going to look to the CAO just because I know the people are watching going, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this actually arose, uh, it's the best practice in terms of policies for municipalities, but it, it arose out of our data governance committee that council recently established. And this policy essentially just provides clear direction to both staff, council and the public about what documents are publicly available. So we don't have to, to put those over to a FOIA pop application. We can provide them uh, to the public without having to go through that process. So it just sets that out. Um, the Data Governance Committee is, is eventually working towards an open data type environment. But um, this, so this is kind of opposite. It says everything else has to go through FOIA pop except for these things. But these are the publicly available pieces of information that we do carry. And eventually, once we analyze our data and know which has private information or information that we'd have to redact, um, for certain to FOIA pop, then we'll, we may expand on this list or change it a bit. But for now, it provides that guidance that and staff need so that they can just give the documents to the public without having to come see me and run it through a FOIA pop application. 
Okay, any any questions on that? Again, this will come to the council meeting in two weeks. Councillor Caldwell? Uh, freedom of information has always been an important issue for me, and I applaud this initiative. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, section 5, 5, 2, I guess. Is that section, I'm just wondering if it's sort of, um, in a way, makes the policy irre irrelevant? If you can just say, that it, you know, it affects the department and you're not releasing a record. The the intent is that um, if if it's a if it's a massive information request, that they're all publicly available documents, but it's ten years worth of of reviewing files that will impact the day to day operation. So that's what it's meant meant to address in that case. Um, and then if, if that's the case, then there is, there is a step there where it says if we can't get back to you within two business days, we'll tell you how long it's going to take us to do it. It's just it, it can't it can't bog down a department so so badly that they can't do their day to day. It's very rare that you would get requests like that, but they could happen. Did you have another question or is this that one? Any other? Uh, that's, that's fine. Thank you. OK, any other questions? OK, so uh, someone prepared to make a motion and we'll discuss this again in two weeks. Sure. I will. I'll make a motion. Oh, w Mayor Tanner beat you to it, Councilor Brazier. <laughs> <laughs> I move the town council for the town of Bridgewater give notice pursuant to Section 48 of the Municipal Government Act that at the June 28, 2021 council meeting, the proposed routine access policy will be considered which would provide an outline of the general documents and information that are routinely and readily available for distribution to the public. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Fragier. We've had a discussion already. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, down to business arising and unfinished business. Uh, we have 10.1, which is the second and final reading of the proposed wastewater betterment charge bylaw um and there's garrett i knew, I knew garrett was here welcome again garrett good evening uh so i have a little presentation here that i'm going to share so a second to get it up You're all pretty well versed in this anyway and have seen the presentation multiple times, uh, but we'll go through it one more time. So this is the second and final reading of the wastewater betterment charge bylaw. Uh, so offsetting is quantifying wastewater usage for development and major renovations to help limit the strain that increased use has on an already burdened system. As you're all aware, the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment require prevention of overflows due to development or redevelopment, and it proposed the elimination of overflows by the year 2039. Uh, so some details from the first reading, uh, offset the cost to the town of reducing combined and sanitary sewer overflows due to development or redevelopment, offset funds to be used to cover the cost for capital cost planning, uh, engineering studies, surveying legal and financing of wastewater infrastructure, and implement a charge similar to those implemented by Halifax Water in 2014 and the Municipality of East Hants in 2006. Uh, one key thing to take away is that uh, this bylaw uh, uh, does not require extension of municipal services to a property. Um, so at the town's expense, it would still be the property owner's expense to do that. Uh, the rates um, would be set as part of the Town of Bridgewater Fees Policy 89. Uh, residential dwellings would be charged $1,500 per dwelling unit and commercial development $20 per square meter, which works out to $1.86 a square foot. Industrial, institutional, and high-intensity use, 
uh, would be determined by the town engineer on an individual basis. And this is simply because um, these types of developments aren't common um, and they, uh, for high intensity use, they vary quite significantly um, in the amount of wastewater that's being released and therefore uh, a more thorough uh, investigation into that is warranted. Uh, policy for usage of charges. So fees policy amendment is part of this bylaw request. Uh, the wastewater betterment fee reserve policy um, is part of the summer 2021 reserve policy amendments. Uh, requirements to ensure that these funds collected by uh, the wastewater betterment fee are used effectively. So the funds should be de dedicated to wastewater offsetting improvements. Uh, funds to be incorporated into I and I operating and capital budgets, and where these projects uh, can become quite complex um, and large in scale, the flexibility to carry forward these funds would be required. Uh, so our consultation plan has completed. Uh, there was a focus group held with developers in April on Teams, uh, which was attended quite well. Um, advertised on the town website, social media, and newspaper throughout April and May. Uh, request uh, for public feedback on the bylaw in April and May as well. Uh, the frequently asked questions pamphlet was released um, and the addressing of the public feedback. Uh, so as part of this second reading, uh, the recommendations are uh, staff recommends the implementation of a wastewater betterment charge bylaw and fee structure that allows a set residential fee of $1,500 per unit and commercial rate of $20 per square meter to be charged for any development in accordance with the bylaw. And two, that staff recommends that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater give notice pursuant to Section 48 of the Municipal Government Act that at June 14th meeting of Town Council, um, the proposed uh, changes to policy 89 fees as previously discussed uh, be approved. A little shorter tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you. Uh, questions from members of council? I know we, we have seen this a number of times. Um, No questions, not seeing any hands up. Okay, someone prepared to make a motion? Councillor Caldwell. I move that uh, Council for the Town of Bridgewater approve the second reading of the Wastewater Betterment Charge Bylaw as presented in document 21-055. Adopt as bylaw chapter 206 and authorize staff to publish all public notices pursuant to section 168 of the Municipal Government Act. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Conklin. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, and so with that, uh, the next thing we have is the proposed amendments to policy 89 fees to include wastewater betterment charge. Uh, the notice was given at the May 10th um, council meeting. And so uh, with the intention of that coming to tonight's meeting, um, are there any questions on that? It's kind of standard to put these in the fees policy. Um, we've spent quite a bit of time over the last couple of years removing things out of the bylaw policy, out of the bylaw so that it's easier to amend the fees and is to have to redo all the bylaws just to change a dollar amount. Um, so as if the public is wondering why we're doing that, it's to make it easier to facilitate in the future without a very cumbersome process. Uh, is anyone prepared to make this motion? Councilor Fugier. I'll make your motion. Yes. Thank you. I made the motion that Council for the Town of Bridgewater approve the revised policy 89 fees as presented in the document 21-055B and including new wastewater betterment charge fees as policy for the town 
effected upon publishing of the public notice of adoption of Chapter 206, Wastewater Betterment Charge Bylaw. Thank you. Uh, seconded by Councillor Thorburn. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, we're down to our final item at 10.2, which is a recommendation of the Heritage Advisory Committee, uh, Cornwallis Street renaming. Um, Mayor so Mitchell? Can... Yes. Sorry, I, I uh, needed to declare a conflict given I'm a resident of the street. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor Tanner. So you'll, I guess you'll drop off and then uh, we'll let you know when the meeting's coming back. Perfect. Um, and I see Mr. Brown is here, I guess, to, to answer any questions that we have. Uh, coming forward, uh, as the public will remember, uh, about a year ago, um, well, a July 13th council meeting, council referred the item of renaming uh, Cornwall Street to the Heritage Advisory Committee. And uh, since then, we've received uh, a petition uh, at requesting that the street be renamed. Um, I know we've received some questions on why there was a a delay, and some of that is uh, we were waiting for the Bridgewater Anti-Racism Task Force to be formed, um, throw in some COVID meeting delays, and uh, a little bit of confusion over the the, the motion uh, and the lack of clarity, uh, the motion, and it's fast forward to today, and that's why it's taken a little bit um, longer than I know people anticipated it would. Um, there's a lot of information in the documentation you've received, including a uh, recommendation from the Heritage Advisory Committee, and we have a couple of members here. But if we could perhaps, uh, we probably should start. Um, what what is the what is the will of council? The wish of council. Councillor Caldwell. May I make a motion? You may make a motion. Yes, please. I move the council for the town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of the Heritage Advisory Committee and rename Cornwallis Street so that the street name is not assumed commemorative of an individual associated with the actions of the British government against the Mi'kmaq and the other indigenous peoples of Canada. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor McDonald. Thank you. Uh, discussion. Councillor Thorburn. You're muted, Councillor Thorburn. I spent a couple hours a day with a resident down on Cornwallis Street who felt that she wasn't uh, really involved in that. There was very little or no discussion. And she would like to see this name change postponed until the residents there had been talked to individually to listen to their feelings. Uh, she wanted proof that that street was named after uh, Cornwallis and uh, I looked there a long while ago and I can't find where it this particular street was. I know the town of Loomberg did an order of him and so did the town of Shelburne. So uh, she would like to see this postponed for a couple of months and uh, and I think the residents should be heard. I know with COVID we didn't do much so I will not support the motion unless there's a, a delay to let the residents be heard. Uh, that's my personal feeling. So, thank you. Discussion from others. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong that there was feedback given from residents on the street to the Heritage Advisory Committee. Council Caldwell, you were first. Uh, yes, uh, we did receive notable feedback from the residents of the street. Um, the majority of the residents of the street uh, gave us uh, feedback. Um, I will say, I think all of the people we heard from on the street were against the name change. Um, I will say I respect the opinions of those people and I took those into account. Um, but after careful reflection, um, it's become clear to me what the right thing to do is. Ultimately, this isn't about a street name. This is about the town's relationship with the Aboriginal community, acknowledging past wrongs, and it's about moving respectfully forward with reconciliation. Over time, our values change. Um, 
and our commemoration of Cornwallis should as well. And I'll be voting in favor of the thing. Thank you, Councillor Frazier. Uh, yes, I just want to say, uh, you know, just sort of recapping as part of the Heritage Advisory Committee, um, a letter did go out, um, like, you know, after the motion uh, was received by Council for the direction uh, for the Heritage Advisory Committee to deliberate and um, as chair of the Heritage Advisory Committee um, and members, we drafted a letter uh, to go out to the residents uh, of Cornwallis Street. Um, that was uh, late, late summer, early September, like, uh, around that time frame. And the deliver, uh, the ha they were hand delivered to the residents of Cornwallis. Um, and I think, yes, there's 14 residents that live on Cornwallis, and I think. Uh, the purpose of the letter was to inform them of what is taking place. For, um, some weren't aware of this, what was taking place. Uh, some took the time to provide emails, letters back. Um, and part of that communication was to inform uh, that we would keep them up to date on the process of um, saying that uh, it is a process. We weren't in any rush, but... As we know, we've had the pandemic and communication hasn't been the best with the opportunity to meet face to face. Um, and uh, we did inform them that we're, there was a new anti-racism task force meeting of the town that was going to be engaged uh, with the discussions of the Heritage Advisory. Um, so I do feel that the committee could have, you know, because of the delays that hearing more uh, feedback from the residents um, was was challenging, but I think we could have done better to give them the opportunity uh, to speak um, and hear from them once again. That's just my opinion. Other comments? I know for me, I, I mean, I understand the residents of the street don't want the name changed for a variety of reasons. Um, concerns that it's erasing history or uh, all the way to the annoyance of having to change documentation. Mm. Um, you know, we've, we've heard that it's not the desired action uh, that they'd like. But I do believe that, without a doubt, that removing the Cornwallis name is the right thing to do. We do know, in fact, that this street was named after Edward Cornwallis, just like all the all the Cornwallis streets across the province are named after Edward Cornwallis. Um, but to be clear, this this is not erasing history because history can't actually be erased because it's completed. You can't undo history. Removing a street sign um, doesn't change that any more than taking a statue down does. But what history gives us is information and education, and what we learn from history should ensure that we are not rejoicing in the wrong things or the wrong people. We shouldn't be revering or celebrating bad people or bad actions or terrible actions for obvious reasons. Uh, today, June 14th, we, knowing what we know, we would never name a new street Cornwallis. So why would we keep a street named Cornwallis? Because we wouldn't, we wouldn't name a new street that because we know from history of the terrible things that Edward Cornwallis did to the indigenous population. And I understand that, you know, changing the name creates an inconvenience for the residents. And I, I'm not trying to diminish that, but that that's a temporary inconvenience versus the pain that uh, is felt by people who see that street every day and see the name of the person who essentially led to the murder of their ancestors commemorated in a sign. Um, in addition to that, um, the, the discovery of the 215 children buried at the Kamloops Residential School highlights that uh, so many wrongs have been done and uh, the response has traditionally been with words of I'm sorry um, without actions behind them. And so I feel and I will be supporting the motion because I feel that this is an action we can take. It's a it's 
Um, it's not going to undo what we've done uh, or the pain that's been caused, but I think it's a necessary step forward, as Councillor Caldwell said, in terms of reconciliation. So I will be supporting the motion. Councillor Frigier, you were uh, you had your hand up next. Uh, yes, um, I just wondered if we've considered anything more of the process. Um, so if if a name is requesting to be changed, what is the next step as to uh, the process of renaming and how I, I think for for myself and for others would like to know um, is it is it the residents of Cornwallis are they going to be able to uh, partake in having that uh, discussion of the renaming have we considered that at this stage we haven't had a formal discussion but I believe the intent was to involve the residents um mm -hmm. in that process i know that there's there's an, another motion in terms of the policy so our policy mm -hmm. now uh is regarding how we name parks and streets um and i know that the the second motion tonight will be to uh ask the heritage advisory committee um along with the anti-racism task force to update the criteria and process to inform how the evaluation and recommendation of new street names are presented to council. Um, so that's one part of it. But in terms of this, we don't traditionally rename streets. Correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, Mr. Brown, but normally we name streets because they're brand new. Uh, I don't remember ever renaming a street, but I think it would be fair to uh, to at least uh, reach out and involve the people who are, are impacted, the people on the street. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tammy, I see you have your hand yeah. up. Yeah, I, I was just going to state that I, I know the Heritage Advisory Committee has uh, as a second recommendation looking for a process for new street names. Council could also direct that they consider a process for renaming of streets because um, there may be others that come along that Council wishes to rename and having a process outlined for the committee in terms of your expectations with respect to consultation with the residents, is it a petition? Is it just a survey? Um, do they form a group and come up with a name? There's a number of ways it could, it could happen. Um, so having the, the committee perhaps develop that process and get council's agreement to it for this, as well as future ones, might be useful. Thank you. Councillor McDonald. Um, so I, I want to thank the Heritage Advisory Committee. I think that a lot of work and a lot of very careful uh, planning a very careful approach and a very thoughtful. Um, I think they reached out to the residents in a very thoughtful manner. Um, I think they really showed a lot of respect for them from from the sounds of what I'm hearing, and I, I really appreciate the work that went into that. Uh, I think that a fantastic connection has been established now. Re renaming somebody's street is going to be inconvenient. If somebody asked me, "Do you want to rename your street?" My answer would be, "No, what a pain." Um, so I, I absolutely understand that the residents need to to uh, be aware that we're not just going to change the name of a street and walk away from them. We're going to walk through that with them, um, and we need to create that policy policy and establish those those procedures. Um, Councillor Caldwell and and your worship put it very eloquently. Uh, I don't have a ton to add to that. There's no question in my mind uh, whether the street should be renamed or not. Um, the only question for me now is how we proceed in the most respectful and uh, respectful way for the residents of the street that includes them and makes sure that the inconveniences are as minimized as possible. But thank you very much to the Heritage Advisory Committee for the work that's been done and the work that I know will go into this because this isn't a small job. It sounds small. You change the name of a street and you change a sign. It's a lot more than that and it's a lot more for the residents. So so I really appreciate the work that's gone into it. Thank you. Um, Councillor Thorburn, you were next. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm not opposed to rename the street. And I want to make that very clear. But the process where this person or person on that street would like to talk in person, not have a letter dropped in their mailbox. And that's all I'm asking. I certainly would support if the opportunity was there for them to debate in person and the motion come back, I would certainly support it. But Denying them that opportunity, to me, I can't support. That's just the way it is. Thank you. 
Councillor Caldwell. Uh, I would like to note, uh, should we, uh, regarding the uh, renaming of streets policy, uh, not only uh, should council um, direct that the, the policy include consulting of residents of the street, but I'd also like to see us uh, include covering any costs incurred by residents as a result of a change. Of a renaming, so I Correct. my my sense renaming, is renaming, yeah, yeah. So my sense is when this goes to HAC, uh, if 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 the second motion that we we do later is to refer this to HAC to to update the policy and the criteria, then those are the those are the things that have to be worked out, right? Because naming is very different than renaming and things. Yeah, I I concur. Uh, further, further discussion, Councillor Fugier. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, as, as Wayne said, uh, Councillor Councillor Thorben said, um, it's not so much that um, it's giving those residents the opportunity to, you know, to say their voice, which I feel that we've. Um, being on the Heritage Advisory, um, we indicated that we would keep them informed. Um, and it's, I feel pressured from the recency in the news that we're moving this along quicker. Um, the outcome would likely could be the same. I'm not saying that I'm not in support of it. It's just uh, feeling that we're missing the opportunity of hearing from the residents. And I, I feel strongly about that and I agree with Councillor Thorburn if we could defer the decision or allow the opportunity for the residents to uh, whether it's I understand we're doing virtual teams now but if we could um, give them the opportunity to let them know in advance that it's on the agenda um, that's that's my uh, opinion that I would like it deferred if we could you know what's What's the difference of two weeks at that? Thank you, Councillor McDonald. Uh, just kind of reflecting on those concerns that the the committee might feel like they um, had, I won't say make a promise, made a commitment to residents that they feel like they're not going to be um, permitted to fulfill if we mm -hmm. move forward the way we're moving forward right now. Mm -hmm. Was there a process? that the committee had in place that maybe just didn't make it back to council so that we knew what the process was going to be with, with addressing residents? Councillor Fajir, did you want to Yeah, respond? so the Heritage Advisory, uh, we met last Wednesday. Um, and uh, there was quite a discussion of moving this forward to the next council meeting. And to me, when I look at the time frame, there wasn't enough time to get out to the residents. I personally didn't have that opportunity. Um, so I feel that, you know, they haven't been given the opportunity to uh, hear their voices at council. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, I feel it was very, very rushed from uh, the notice and not giving ample time to the residents. Mr. Brown. Hi, I thought I would uh, chime in. Um, just regarding the process, um, the Heritage Advisory Committee, representatives of the Heritage Advisory Committee and representatives of the Anti-Racism Task Force met and um, a, a plan was put together um, and it was, it was a, a three-part consultative process where whereby the Cornwall Street residents would be uh, engaged and, and ideally, um, in a, in a group setting face to face, um, you know, it, it likely would have taken some time to get there. Um, there were other ideas where, you know, maybe we could uh, or they could appoint a representative uh, to uh, to voice any concerns on behalf of the of the street residents, uh, property owners. So that was one piece. There was another piece where it was uh, a, a more general uh, public consultative uh, process, um, educating um the public on 
uh, on Edward Cornwallis and, and you know, memorializing, um, you know, statues, street names uh, after individuals who, um, you know, may not uh, share the same values as, as, as most do today. So those who, who um, you know, are, are you know, oppressive uh, and or uh, upsetting to, to members of our community. Uh, the third part, um, I just have to, to open up my, my report here. Uh, oh, it was a town, no, the second part was town hall style uh, for the general public. Um, the third part, sorry. Ah, uh, yes, um, meeting with the uh, local indigenous community. So that was a plan that uh, the Anti-Racism Task Force and the Heritage Advisory Committee came up with um, uh, um, last month. Um, as far as the Heritage Advisory Committee's um, meeting last week, uh, when the motion was made and, and passed by the committee, um, I delivered uh, reports, this report uh, that went to council this evening uh, to residents of Cornwall Street uh, on Friday afternoon and had a few conversations. So um, there was um, some discussion but it all happened very quickly. So I know a lot of them felt that they didn't have enough time to prepare. So thank you, Nick, for that. Um, and thank you for everyone for, for uh, sharing your perspectives. I respect your, your thoughts on this very much. Um, I, yeah, I understand where the residents are coming from. Live, you live on a street for a long time. You don't want to change the street name. You're you're very much attached to it. Um, to me, though, the, the Cornwallis name, and again for me, simply cannot remain as a street in our community. We know uh, the history of Edward Cornwallis. We know um, the pain that the name causes the indigenous uh, community. Um, we have a petition with over 800 signatures on it asking us to to change the name. Um, we know that of the 14 uh, houses on Cornwallis, I believe HAC received uh, feedback from nine. Um, and what we've heard is they're all they're all opposed to it. So to me that the if you wait two weeks, two months or two years, the outcome uh, or the the response from the street is still the same. Don't change the street name. So I understand their desire to to express that. And, and I guess this is me saying to them, I've I've heard that through through HAC. I've heard that you are opposed to renaming the street. I guess for me, um, it comes down to the greater good. It comes down to what is the right thing to do. And I, I, I simply do not see that path being to keeping that street name. And so if you if you believe that the name needs to change, then the outcome has already been determined. So for me, the Cornwallis name, my vote is in favor of the motion because I can't see the name can staying. Absolutely, they should be part of the process for the new name of the street. Um, but again, I'll be supporting the motion because I, I don't think it, it, it simply can't remain Cornwallis and waiting two weeks or two months doesn't change that, um, that view of mine. Councilor McDonald. I didn't expect to say this coming into tonight, but I, I think my mind may have been changed. Um, one of my concerns, I don't like that the committee is put in a position where they feel like they've made a commitment that they can't fulfill. Um, I think that's a terrible position to put our, our volunteers in. Um, and I can't imagine the argument that would make me make me feel like the name should stay, but um, I haven't heard the arguments. So uh, nobody to this point has told me why the residents are so attached to that name that they would want to keep it despite um, the history and, and, and what's known to us now, but I haven't heard them. So I don't, I don't feel it's appropriate to make a decision without hearing everyone. I feel very strongly about the direction I'm going in. It would take um, one heck of an argument to change um, the, where, where I'm leaning, but um, I think it is my job and my role to hear all sides and before I make a decision. So um, if, if there is a feeling that if we deferred for a couple of weeks, like two weeks, 
Um, I think this is already past due, so I, I'm, I'm not looking at months. But if there was a feeling that if we deferred for a couple of weeks, that the commitment to the residents could be fulfilled and we would receive their feedback and uh, be able to make the decision with their their feedback in front of us, then I would be willing to do that. But it, there would have to be a commitment that that, that could happen fairly fast because I, I think we're too late in doing this now. Okay, thank you. Any more discussion? Okay, so there is a there is a motion on the floor, um, and I'm hearing I'm hearing multiple uh, positions. So what I'm going to do is ask for uh, a yay and a show of hands for if in favor and then against, just so I can keep track. This is why I don't like virtual meetings. I can't. Some people are big squares. Some people are small squares on my screen. Councillor McDonald, yes. Sorry, before you do that, can I ask for some feedback as to whether deferring for a couple of weeks would be sufficient or if that's just completely unreasonable? I don't want to ask for something unreasonable. The committee. Uh, you. It's, uh, that's going to be up to HAC who, if they're going to go back and re-engage the, the residents of the street, I, I don't know how, I don't know. Like I'm, their motion was to deal with this tonight. That their recommendation was mm -hmm. was actually to do this tonight. So I'm going based on that. So I don't know if I don't know if they're even prepared to go back out and do this to engage. Uh, Councillor Caldwell, I see you have your hand up first. Yes, uh, I'll just reiter reiterate that uh, this what we're dealing with the motion from Heritage Advisory. It was not to consult further. It was to. Uh, th this was their recommendation. Um, so I, I'm not sure <laughs> where we would go from here. And I will say um, we did hear from the residents. We heard from Nick would know the number. It's close to three quarters of the residents probably we heard from. And uh, I'm sure Nick would have all that information for the council to uh, to look at. But uh, the residents were quite uh, eloquent in their arguments and um we had a lot of very long written responses i think we we've consulted adequately they made themselves very clear i'm not sure what more consultation would do frankly i uh, thank you um uh, amy's next yeah i was just going to ask if the intention was that um the consultation happened at the Heritage Advisory Committee table, or was it for council? Because as, as Councillor Caldwell indicated, the Heritage Advisory Committee has made their recommendations. So it's it's just you may want to clarify where you intend the public consultation to occur. Yeah, because it also did sound like perhaps it was inviting them to a council meeting, which was the other option. Councillor Fajir, did you want to add to that? Um, I just want to say my uh, trying to be fair to all sides and giving everybody equal opportunity. Um, and I come back to that original letter that went out and, um, and and informing the residents that they would be updated on the process and um, just the timing of our meeting uh, that we had to make a decision last Wednesday and and I know council has agendas set um, and has to plan for meetings, just like anybody else that um, uh, receives information and needs to prepare. So uh, I'm just asking um, from, from the residents' perspective to give them an opportunity, um, not saying it will change the outcome, but um, at the same time, just feeling um, giving them the opportunity if they wish to speak. Okay, thank you. Further comments? Okay, so we'll we'll address the motion that's on the floor, and then we'll we'll take it from there. Um, does everybody understand the motion that's on the floor? A bunch of nods. Okay. All those in favor, again, please signify by saying aye and then raise your hand so I can see. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, one, two, three, four. Those opposed? 
So nay and raise your hand. Nay. Two opposed. Motion is carried. Thank you. Um, if you refresh your e-scribe, there's is an updated motion, the second motion to incorporate um, a conversation that we just had in terms of not just naming but renaming streets. Um, so this is the uh, to to deal with the consultation in HAC in consultation with the anti-racism task force to update the criteria and the process to inform how uh, evaluation and recommendation new and renamed street names are presented to council. Is someone prepared to make that motion? Councilor McDonald. Find my mute button. <laughs> I move that uh, Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of the Heritage Advisory Committee and direct the HAC to draft a revision to Policy 16, naming of streets in consultation with the Anti-Racism uh, Task Force to update the criteria and process to inform how the evaluation and recommendation of new street names are presented to Council for subsequent consideration by Council. Thank you. Seconded by? I'll second that. Councillor Conklin, discussion. I feel like we kind of already had half of this discussion on this one as well. Um, ready for the question? I'm so used to Councillor Thurber going, question. Can't wait to bring Councillor Chambers. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Um, that was our last item before we go in, in camera, but I uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say how I appreciate um, discussions like that are not they're not easy. They're not supposed to be easy. Um, they're emotional. They're difficult. There's pressures from all sides. So I just I do want to say again how much I appreciate and respect um, every counselor's willingness to express their honest self. Um, I know it's not easy. Um, so I just I just wanted you to know that I appreciate that. So I hope that that doesn't change, that you stay true to yourself and that uh, regardless of, of what the topic is. So thank you. I appreciate that. Welcome back, Deputy Mayor Tanner. Um, there is nothing else before us. We do have an in camera um, to deal with contract negotiations. So I'll be looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Councilor Thorben seconded by. Come on, Andrew. <laughs> oh, it's too late. Cancer, it's the cancer call. We are adjourned. Thank you.